that to do that, and I should have. I um, something. So this is the fourth of um, the civic media and uh, new civic Mo art and media series here. Um, the building you are in is uh, Art Culture Technologies called the Cube, and this series is jointly presented by ACT as well as Comparative Media Studies. Um, and just a note about um, uh, the genesis of ACT is that um, my department started, so I have a lecture here, my name is Mike Rosanna, yeah. yeah. and I'll be a respondent later. Um, and I was a grad student here in the master's <coughs> program. And our, our department started in 1968 when there was social upheaval around the world, and artists were really trying to figure out how to collaborate with scientists and engineers and um, provide a critical resistance to what was happening. Um, and throughout, um, in different moments throughout my department's long history, um, we've had um, uh, s relationships with uh, CMSW, Comparative Media Studies, which I think is a really important component to thinking about the arts, um, because without this attention to how to broadcast uh, work or creative um, creative works, uh, the arts remain really insular. So this is an important lecture series, and we're glad to be bridging the department. Um, so uh, introducing Myron Dooley, who we're really honored to have here, um, is Lisa Parks, and she can also say a few um, quick things about CMSW. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before, we, thank you. Uh, before we begin, uh, this evening, uh, we would like to recognize the land that we walk upon and the tribes that were here before us and that continue to exist in the Massachusetts area and throughout the region, including the Massachusetts, the uh, Wapanawa, the Nipmuc, and the Nofset people. Um, and I just want to make sure that we all are aware of the, the tribes in the area. We all have a lot of learning to do about this, myself included. And having Myron here helps us and challenges us to um, think about these issues and the way that we integrate them into our pedagogy and our daily lives and even our research and artwork. So I just wanted to start with that uh, comment and um, just be, especially with the Survivors Week coming up next week, be aware of, of the importance of these issues among indigenous peoples in North America. Um, uh, my, my name is Lisa Parks. <laughs> I'm a, pr a professor of comparative media studies here at MIT. And it's a genuine pleasure to welcome you to our event tonight, uh, which is the CMS Colloquium and the Civic Arts Lecture Series. The event is supported by Comparative Media Studies and Writing, um, ACT and the Global Media Technology and Cultures Lab, as well as Professor Jim Carradine, who is over here on the side of the room. I also want to say thanks to the research assistants in my lab that did a lot of work to help make this event happen, um, and as well as Mauricio Cordero, who has designed this poster and all of the posters for the series, uh, this lecture series that Marissa John has uh, co-organized as well. So our speaker today is filmmaker, educator, and community journalist and activist Myron Dewey. Myron is Paiute Shoshone from the Walker River Paiute Tribe in the Great, Great Basin area of Nevada. Myron has worked in the field of information technology since 1997. In 2003, he started a business called Digital Smoke Signals that focused on computer and internet consulting. He then went on to finish a master's degree in indigenous studies at the University of Kansas and has worked for many years on digital language preservation and what he calls the indigenization of technology and media. His IT work has always had a social dimension and has addressed youth education, gender-based violence, and tribal sovereignty issues, among many other issues. Thousands of people around the world became familiar with Myron Dewey's work during the Dakota Access Oil Pipeline protests on the Standing Rock Reservation in 2016 and 17. Using live streaming, drones, and social media, Myron, with other drone activists such as Dean Deadman, worked creatively and tirelessly to use the sovereign airspace above tribal lands to witness and cover energy partners' infrastructural incursions onto the territories of the Standing Rock Reservation, including onto sacred burial grounds. Much of Myron Dewey's work documented the standoffs 
between peaceful water protectors and heavily militarized county, state, and federal law enforcers, together with privatized security teams of Tiger Swan. Uh, Dewey used Facebook Live to keep his relatives near and far informed about what was happening from an indigenous perspective and went on to direct a documentary film called Awake, A Dream from Standing Walk, Standing Rock, which we screened on campus last night and which also premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival in 2017 and is available online. And I strongly encourage you to see the film if you haven't seen it yet and to share it with friends, family, and others that might be interested. Um, on the basis of his film work, he's also recently been invited to teach a class in the spring at Duke University. In the process of doing the work he did at Standing Rock, he had 30 drones destroyed or confiscated and faced the charge of stalking, which maybe he can talk to us a bit about tonight. Some have referred to, drones, to Dewey's drone activism as a new form of tactical media, as it has involved the art of getting access, hacking the power, and disappearing at the right moment. But it is also important to note that indigenous media have always been tactical media, long before digital media theorists came up with this concept, and are arguably the first form of tactical media. Um, though I was one of the thousands of people watching Myron's coverage of the Dapple protests, I had the privilege of meeting him in person earlier this year um, when we served on a panel together at Brown University called surveillance. And to prepare for our event, I read many law enforcement and FAA records related to, related to Standing Rock protests that were released in FOIA requests, Freedom of Information Act requests. And as I wanted to understand the state and private surveillance and militarization practices that had been mobilized against peaceful water protectors at Standing Rock. These policing practices have been aimed at Myron directly on multiple occasions, and he's endured a great deal and has many stories to tell. He's also just returned from Mexico, where he traveled for a week with the so-called migrant caravan in order to witness and document what is happening for his tribal elders, what is happening for, so he can communicate that to his tribal elders. We are extremely fortunate to have Myron Dewey here with us tonight, and I'd like you to join me in giving him a warm welcome to MIT. Aonamaga, nananiya hoba tsunami na agaitaka na na kai taibo yarua pijan nama yarua. As as I introduce my name. And just thank everyone for being here. And I wanted to open up in my language to let you know that we still have our language here. And I want to uh, thank Lisa for acknowledging the tribes, the land that we're on. It's very important that uh, the community know no matter where you go throughout the United States, you're on Indian land. And the tribes are still there. There's over 568 federally recognized tribes. And right now, the tribes are trying to hold on to their federal status, which is the trust responsibility between the United States and the tribes' trust relationship, which is being threatened by this administration, as you guys know, with the Wapanag Nation. So um, with this, we'll start with, I uh, want to start you guys off with a little bit of the media um, that I witnessed growing up on the reservation, was, which was not a presence in the indigenous communities, which was native media. In Nevada is a great example. We have two military bases on both sides of our reservation. And we still don't have native media or native radio or native TV there. And so my goal is to, we're, we're in a time now where we have access. So instead of saying we can't, it's like, what can we do? And what you guys are witnessing is this is what we can do. Let's create the solutions that we have access to right now, which right now the window in media and social media is closing. It's closing very, fairly fast. An example is, is shadow blocking, which is happening now on social media, which I documented. And I'm trying to document this in real time so those who are witnessing can actually see what's happening and how to counteract it to get the media out. My goal to go down to Mexico was to make sure that our indigenous people got a voice. 
and to go witness what was happening so our people here can understand it from an indigenous perspective what we are seeing. Something that our journalists down there, when I was down there with the El Salvadorian um, caravan, there was only two journalists and they were not active, they were only filming. And I asked them, so what are you guys doing? Are you volunteering or do, no, we don't, we, don't, we don't bother nobody, we just do our thing. Well, our goal was to establish communication down there. But we call it the Poinabi. The Poinabi is the one that goes ahead, to scout ahead. So when the rest of the tribe comes, they're gonna be in a safe area or safe position, a safe place. And what I witnessed at Standing Rock was an example of what I'm seeing now in Mexico. We've seen corporate militarization having the funding at a low budget and the militarization of um, putting, around the wall, uh, putting a wall around the pipeline. What I'm gonna see happening down in this border is it's an excuse. It feels like a, a politically motivated agenda to exactly what happened to us being demonized and considered jihadist terrorists. That's what we were considered at Standing Rock. To down here at the border, they're already starting to demonize them coming across the border. So I had to show people who they were women, children, elders, there were some handicapped, wearing Crocs, wearing sandals, um, some people were educated, some people were fleeing for their lives for particular reasons to educate and get a, find a better life for their community. And the only way to do it is to go on the ground and in the area we were in, I really learned a lot. In that short amount of time, I learned that I can't film just anywhere because we were in narco territory. And if you guys are familiar with that, it's people who can kidnap you for sex trafficking, organ harvesting. I mean, just unreal. I felt like I was in my own movie again. And, and I really was, uh, it really broke my heart to see um, that to know that our relatives are being kidnapped and to hear the stories of them. Like if you were here one or two, you'd be kidnapped. And it really just kind of broke my heart seeing the children and there's no defense. And so what they were doing is traveling together as tight as they possibly could. I'm seeing an escalation from Standing Rock, which is the testing ground. It's a spark, that spark from that sacred fire. For many people, um, they needed that part, but what I'm seeing is the bigger picture. This is something for the last 500 years we've witnessed, and what have we learned as a, as a, a family together in the United States that we're not acting as? And we're seeing that divide now. And when I'm asking people to help, I'm like, don't get political. Either if you're indigenous, I want to know how you can be a good relative. Because I'm down there for the Eagle and the Condor prophecy that predates conquistador and colonialism. If you're an, a non-native, how can you be a good ally? And if you have no religion or you're an anarchist, you know, how can you be just a good human being to help people that need help that are less fortunate than us right now at this moment? And what we're seeing is this propaganda media, that was the goal to go down and contradict, uh, counteract it and debunk it and do it in a live stream where there's no cutting and editing. So for two hours straight I would film, here's what I see and just kind of narrate a little bit about what I'm witnessing. So coming from Standing Rock, you know, the drones, I did fly drones down there and I had to do it differently. So I did it right in the open, right in front of the officers. And I just was like, I'm just gonna do it like I belong here. And they kind of liked it, and I just, you know, give them an Indian nod like that. <laughs> they didn't know what to think, they just kind of, you know, but they got machine guns on, you know, I'm thinking, oh, I don't you know, wanna cause any conflict. So, you know, you ask, and I ask, and um, they didn't know, they look at each other, no comprende, so I flew. And they thought it was really cool, and I was able to document from another perspective which I call eagle eye, and to share that perspective with you guys through indigenous eyes, and to go right in there and document people close and share with them. And some of them um, we did interviews with, and I brought uh, um, shirts with the eagle and the condor and the digital smoke signals logo so they can hashtag where their journey is so we can follow them and make sure they're safe along their route. So um, luckily it's not escalating to, to this part yet, which it will, and this is what I'm worried about. Do you, click, do you want to show that clip? Yes. Oh, it's, it's uh, um, we're gonna start from right here. This is the beginning of a, of a story that was being told. Uh oh, what's going on here? We got a little bit of spam. A story that was told by LaDonna. 
we're storytellers as indigenous people. And in the beginning of the camp, I walked around to create digital storytellers. And if most of the youth have technology already, they already have phones, Snapchat, Instagram. I did not have to teach them. It's the elders that I got to teach. It's the older people that are scared to break it. And it was, it's always been frustrating to, um, to realize that we have a generation technically hacked in Indian country and they don't want to learn technology. And that's okay because we need those elders to help us and guide us with that information. So the youth just picked it right up. And I crowdsourced the youth and walked around and made sure that they just share their story as community journalists. Many were worried like we're not journalists or we're gonna be attacked for you know, doing this. And I'm like, you're telling your story. We're in Indian country and now you're, it's important to share your voice, share your teachings explain to these people that are watching that we're not who they're saying we are. My name is Lenora Joy Allard. I'm in that secret stone sham fighting the Dakota Access Pipeline. Obama administration made it sound like this was a done deal and he came in to save us. It is not true. We are still standing we ask everybody to continue to stand with us. In January, Dakota Access must provide all of their information by January 31st, and the tribe has 10 days to respond to that. And so there will be a hearing in February. I know that Dakota Access at that time said that we are losing $20 million a week. They should never have done construction in the green. So with us, that is um, a good thing. It is not a win. The Rosebud Camp and Sacred Stone will be standing. We ask everybody who wants to continue to stand with us to come. And we believe that the Obama decision to deny Dakota Access and um, Energy Transfer Partners, the easement, is not a win. We must continue to make the world know that it is the people's voice. It is the empowerment of the people that need to make the change. It is not a government agency. It is not a corporation. Have you seen my beautiful river? Have you seen the beautiful land here? I have a right to learn. And I have a right to make sure that the future generations can live on this land. We need to stand up for the earth again. We, as the people, control the nation. We have a right to live and the people have a right to live, to allow us that right to live. That photo, that's, that right here would not seem like anything unless you understood that where they're standing up on the top is burial sites. That's where they occupied. And so when I go through and to share with you guys what we're seeing in consistent media here and in a synchronized voice, I also wanted you guys to see that what I put in here is the, the barricade that had... Um, has 10 days to respond to. The layers that they had dug and what they put around was consulting wire and there was no archeologist, there was no cultural monitor that tribes have to make sure that, that they, they don't disturb our sacred sites, which they desecrated sacred sites. They didn't disturb, they desecrated. And I knew that I needed to document this. As much as it hurt as a cultural monitor to go and document, this is what I originally got into drones was to protect our sacred sites. And where they went through, they, nobody would have known if they did go through sacred sites or disturbed anything. But what you're seeing is a, their makeshift wall 
And when I share with you guys the Constantine wire, they had it for four miles around the, their drill site, not just right here, but around the property. And they had a, a pit that was about eight feet wide and like 12 feet down that they also dug. And they have two different layers down here with Constantine wire. And it goes all the way around on top, on the bottom, and in the hole. If you can see it going into the hole. So it's in case you fall in there, you're also going to get trapped. What I'm seeing is that this is going to be shipping containers now at the border. That's just what I'm experiencing because now we have a budget of U.S. dollars. This is corporate budget right here, what you're seeing with mercenaries. And so I wanted to share that with you guys because and document it in real time. I can see it wasn't, um, this is a pattern of history with indigenous people. So I had to make sure that we had training as much people, even our allies that come in to hold them accountable when and when not to film. The thing about filming is that we don't film our ceremony. So there was a lot of ceremonies happening. And so there's some media that just got to film. They just got to get it. I mean, they got their camera like this. Even after you tell them, please don't film. They just, they've got their audio on. It doesn't matter. And so what I started to find, the, I knew what the problem was and the solution was to educate our allies. It's like, okay, you need to hold yourself accountable. Because I always share, how do we hold ourselves accountable for our forefathers' promises? It is not your fault what happened to the indigenous people, but it is your responsibility to hold yourself accountable. That's how I feel. And the thousands that came, that's what I was hearing them say. I'm here to hold my family accountable. So what I'm just sharing with you is what I heard from allies coming through. And so this is how I want to express to you is how we start to heal as indigenous people, as allies, because obviously we're not going to go anywhere. We're holding our land. And one way to start the healing is together. We got to acknowledge the atrocities. Survivor's Day, who, do, who doesn't know what that means? It is Thanksgiving. That's what it is. It's not a, it's not a, um, it's for indigenous people, it's not a happy day. And it's a, it's a day we survive. So it's, it's different for indigenous people. So it's not a celebration. And some are moving past that and they are using it to celebrate with families, to be with family and changing the narrative of it. But that's the goal is to educate and empower through here. Um, do we have a, a, a question from about the video you guys just saw? Open up for a few questions and I'll go to the next one. Yes, that'll be right here. And I guess we can, we can start with that then, and then I can answer your question on how um, the video is being used as a visual legal narrative. Awake, the documentary was being used as a visual legal narrative because what they were doing was taking our videos and creating Facebook felonies. And the charge that I got was I actually called in on 911 that we were being stalked by Dakota Access mercenaries. And I got the call because I caught him on the drone in the live feed. And I, I came up and they were sitting up on the hill and I, and I popped up around them and I got their license plates and I got their pictures. And we were able, now we knew who was up on the hill. And um, I've got pictures and selfies of snipers. You know, I'd have to show them, hey, this is real. Um, I got a live feed where a guy was in full mesh. And you know, this is what we're dealing with was community warfare down there. So it was like, I was having to show, hey, there's Tiger Swan here, there's mercenaries here. How did I catch them? I walked up to them and asked them for directions on a live feed. And, and he wasn't so scary when he started talking. He kind of really sounded heel, like a hillbilly. Well, shoot, uh, you know what? And I was like, he's just normal. He just, but he looked all meshed up, you know? And we laughed and talked and I got him on a live feed and you could probably go back and watch it. And then we left and I had a, um, a reporter from the Navajo Times with me. And he's, he was in the military and he said, that's the only time I really puckered up. You know, he's, <laughs> he actually witnessed these guys 
there, fully, fully opted up. No license plates on their vehicle. He says, you know, that, that looks like Blackwater. And I says, no, that's Tiger Swan. You know, that's, that's Blackwater, but it's the new name, Tiger Swan. This is what we have to be prepared for. But they weren't as dangerous um, in, the, in, the, in the sense in front of us, okay? What was dangerous was the militia that nobody was controlling. That was dangerous. People trying to come in and create problems. The infiltration was dangerous. And also our own people that are colonized, that are in the military, that came. Two of them were Kyle Thompson being one who was three affiliated tribes there. And he was actually the gunman with the, the, the AR-15. So there is the complications there, but that's history in Indian Wars. And this is the reason, explain you as a visual legal narrative. Um, the next day, Morton County denied that they used anything there. Any weapons, any water. There was a total of 300 that were injured, but 150 were documented. That was a many that was a visual legal narrative hopefully down the road we're going to have somebody that's able able to hold them accountable for the human rights violations and the constitutional violations that we witnessed that was done as a live feed in real time the three drones were shot down documenting that they had their own drone up on top and i felt that i also document documented a weaponized drone because something came from down and i have it in a video of it shooting straight down it might not have been uh, a, a type of gun, but it seemed like it was more of a, um, could have been uh, weaponized uh, with a rubber bullet or something, but I only got it coming down. And uh, the drone was sitting out in the ice and I had a water protector wanting to go get it too. I was like, no nah, man, we don't need any more people getting hurt. You know, people are hurt bad enough. And um, stories like this to document was like, uh, a repeat of history that was happening that was also I'm correlating with the border is because if you guys don't believe what's happening there, just take a trip to the border for one day. Go in, go down, walk around, and you're going to run into militia. You're going to run into the military. There's 5,000 soldiers that were deployed. You're going to start to see the Constantine wire. You're going to also see your rights as a citizen. How far can you go? And most people don't exercise how far they can go. They kind of stop. And how far can you go? You know, and what is your rights? So um, the day I pulled into Mexico City, uh, the second caravan was, was coming in from Honduras. And um, I, didn't, I don't know Spanish, but only the bad words. So, you know, it's like, 
I kind of had to, um, I have a lot of translators that were translating, but we also had to put disclaimers because one of the, one of the things, again, it was our own people that took out of context the word and made something out of it to social media. And what it did is it caused confusion that, that I was promoting that we were, Jeho I don't know if it was a Jehovah's or, or a, one of the five tribes or eight tribes. I don't even know the religion that has that. I think that's Mormonism. And that wasn't our agenda. Our agenda is to amplify the message of why they're down there to, to witness what we're seeing. So our people up here can actually say, okay, I, now we know we got someone on the ground this is what they're seeing. And we put a disclaimer back up there saying, this is not our, we're just documenting and the translator's translating, there's different speakers. And um, there was many different speakers and this just shows them coming in. This just shows them coming in. And everyone was pretty excited. Uh, there was, uh, I believe 7,200 people on both sides, up here in the stadium, down on the middle, and then on the other side. These tents, were um, these tents were these tents were filled with women and children behind them, and I actually walked down there and I shared with them who knew about the eagle and the condor prophecy, which many of them did know, and we talked about it. And I stuck out like a sore thumb. I mean, there were not a whole. I mean, pretty short people, you know. So I, I felt kind of like I I couldn't maneuver like I was at Standing Rock, you know. There I was really sticking out. And they says Indio, Indio is, and called me original. I was the original here. So it was very, um, just to document what was going on right here too. Now there's a lady, her name is Bertie, that's on the, uh, by the San Diego area. And she's on the Mexican side trying to put all these camps in safety and get them ready. And um, I just, I just kind of, it just really broke my heart to, to see indigenous people have to leave their homes this way and pick up only what they could carry and then just go. And I wanted just to make sure that they understood that, you know, the indigenous people know they're coming and they've been colonized once, we've been colonized. I'm speaking to you in a colonized language. So they've been colonized and they're gonna come to another country and be recolonized. And so it's important that I know that in, this, in the education system, they're not gonna teach them the indigenous history, the atrocities, the sexual abuse that happened with the church, the violence, the force of loss of language, loss of land, loss of dignity. They're not gonna teach them those things where it came from. So I wanna prepare them for that, the discrimination, the racism that they're gonna encounter, the political systematic racism they're gonna encounter in the education, the kidnapping of their children that happened to us. I want to prepare them for, these, for this journey that they're coming to. And I don't know if this, people are doing that. And I'm trying to work with people down there to say, we need to be down there. But we also have to make ourselves have a presence down there and to, re, and to um, let them know that you know, we're matriarchy tribes. We're not a patriarchy. So it's important that they recognize that. So these values come in here into into Indian country. We call it, I still call it Indian country. No matter where I go, it's Indian country to me. And I'm indigenous to this land and I'm gonna share that with them. And that's what I try to do in a good way to educate and um, prepare them for this journey. This is another one uh, to answer your question on the FAA is the FAA denied any drones were being shot. And I had a meeting with the FAA and I shared with them that um, this, this, uh, this airspace is tribal airspace and it's sovereign. And, and um, he kind of disagreed and, and I says, well, they're shooting the drones. He goes, hey, 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 Myron, that's, that's kind of hearsay. And I had it ready on my iPad and this is what I showed him. Pipeline. It's nearly complete despite massive opposition from the water 
actually now, this is how close they are to the river. They're building a barricade around their, uh, their, their site. Oh, so you see that? You see that? You see that? See? It just got hit. Whoa, it got hit again. Their drones are often shot at by police, who, along with private security, are a constant presence around this portion of the 1,172 miles of pipeline. On a night when police shot water protectors with tear gas, rubber bullets, and water cannons in freezing weather, Myron and his crew provided live air to the scene. What we have is percussion grenades being thrown. We have the police are right down on the front. They're, they're spraying water with LRAD. Continue to share as fast as you can. They're trying to hit me. Hold on, I gotta get out of there. Yeah, they've already shot me twice. We're straight up. I'm doing it. Okay. I'm getting away. So the guy that was talking was a medic and he came back and was telling me they're aiming as they're pulling people at, pulling people out, hitting them in the butt. And he got hit in the butt a couple of times. And as they were holding their hands up, they were hitting them in the hands, shooting their hands. And they thought the women were kind of, you know, dressed bundled up were men. They were hitting them in the crotch and they were hitting in kneecaps. They were aiming at to hurt people, to maim people. That's what they were doing. And I interviewed one of the medics that was there on the ground. And this is what we're trying to document in the human rights violations, the constitutional violations. But this didn't happen. They could have, really, there was already a barricade. There was wire there. They could have actually left. But what I see in the difference between here and in Mexico City was women were all inside the, inside the uh, stadium. The energy was different. Nobody was really tense. On the outside, though, it was completely different. The men were on the outside, and the energy was a lot different. So, so with that one, that kind of gives you, I hope that answers your question on creating a visual legal narrative. And I did a call out for drone pilots. I did drone training, um, tried to do uh, as much as I can in walking around and doing live feed training, um, created a, a women's indigenous media group and try to empower the women as much as we possibly could so we have a, a different voice of elders to speak, young people to speak, allies to speak, and to indigenize the media to let them know they're in Indian country and the language you're using, you have to learn what, that, what kind of language we're talking about with sovereignty and treaty and inherent rights and um, kind of re-educating America there, re-educating the media, indigenizing the media on Indigenous 101 which is not easy, guys. You know, we're, we're taught a certain way to, to ignore all of those things. And when it comes time for us to fight and we're in D.C. or in front of a march, we're like, what are these Indians doing here? Well, we're 90% in front of the environmental fights in every action you go to across the country. And uh, the violence against women was on our indigenous women first. It started with Lewis and Clark. And it escalated all the way up from the Mayflower, and it just kept going and going until where we are today with the Dakota Access and the man camps. So these man camps are real. We documented them there. And what I seen in Mexico was oil pipelines down in the cartel area. And I documented them as well. And what I'm seeing is that the, there is no, the violence, the missing murdered indigenous women start from Canada, United States, now I'm getting flooded with messages that our indigenous women from the United States are getting stolen into Mexico, but there's no one documenting the women in Mexico from here. And I know they are in Mexico, but we don't have that. There's a language barrier here, and we're not sharing that. And so we need to get with our relatives from the south and the north and in the middle and combine that, those statistics because these extraction companies are on both sides of the border. And what I know from being in this... Uh, educating about the oil pipelines is that Kelsey Warren's trying to go to Mexico. That's what I know. And I know he's doing it from the Texas area and that is his goal. And for you smart MIT business guys, I need you to guys help articulate the subsidiaries of this company, of these, of how business is done because they create subsidiary companies to hide their parent company. And it's kind of similar to the tribe's immunity in taxation, but they figured out how to do it corporately. And that's what we need to do is to stop them from doing that in these parent companies and these subsidiary companies. Can you explain to people who Kelsey Warren is and also uh, what the man camps are? So Kelsey Warren is the owner of the Dakota Access Pipeline with many subsidiary companies, uh, Energy Transfer.
They did not own the land when they put this burial, when they went over burial sites there as well. He's the one that, um, has, he lives in Texas. His house has been protested many times. And he, um, uh, and Trump endorsed the Dakota Access Pipeline his second day in office. He's got shares in the Dakota Access Pipeline. The man camps are when all these pipelines are being built, they bring them all in into one area, and all men, all that false masculinity, toxicity, they're, the, when, they're, when their downtime is, that's where the missing murdered indigenous women is from these man camps. And so we need to try to find better ways to protect our communities. And many of you guys may have seen them. There's a lot of stories about man camps. There's a lot of shows about man camps, drugs. The, the, there's no accountability and they put them across jurisdiction. So there's no accountability again. What I've seen in with Morton County is they would not cross that line if it was the res, you know? And so that's why we had to hold them accountable because they were on treaty land. And the United States has not honored a treaty yet. So again, I'm asking you guys, you know, how do you have your forefathers honor, honor your, honor your forefathers' promises through the commitment to the indigenous people? Once that's done, then we can start the healing. You'll understand that we can start to believe that this is gonna happen. The education, there is no amount of money that can be contributed back to the indigenous people Less than 2.3% of us are left. We're almost extinct. So you, amount of money is not gonna do anything for us. It actually kills us, the money that we get, pennies on the dollar for our land and our water. This is, for some of this, for you guys, this may be new, but if you go out to the Navajo Nation, you go out to Paiute Nation out in Nevada, Shoshone Nation, the Standing Rock Tribe, where there's mining, coal mining, there's nuclear test sites, Yucca Mountain, there's an indigenous presence trying to protect the water. And how do we know? Because we're connected to the land, we're connected to the traditional medicines, the food sources, and when they start migrating, when they stop moving in those directions, or the water starts flowing, or we can't drink it, something's wrong there. And so with this, I was hoping to get a visual legal narrative so we could have some accountability that we didn't have before. This is uh, one of the other drone pilots, pro prolific. and. He was flying in the very beginning. He came down to um, make a, uh, a video and ended up getting charged seven years. And so I really seen, like, uh, I seen him like my, my little brother. And, you know, I, I seen him, he was really upset and, uh, you know, never been to jail and hasn't, has a family and he didn't know what he was gonna do. And I said, well, you gotta finish it. You know, we gotta, we've gotta make you famous. We've got to literally make you famous to get your, to get your message out there to say here's what they, they're saying that he flew into a airplane with the drone. That's what he was doing, they said. And what Prolific did was he put together his own defense and we got audio from different locations and we scouted people who had footage that was at the action. And what, we, what it came down to in the court was that the judge after he's, he allowed him to show his own testimony and his own information, his own documentation, his own forensics. And it, it, uh, we had audio that shared, um, the officer told him that it was illegal for him to fly underneath 500 feet, which is a violation of FAA regulations. It is illegal for you to fly a drone over 500 feet. And so the judge threw his case out which I thought is very important to share with you that this is no longer the 1800s. You know, we were very well prepared in Western law, international law, treaty law, and inherent law to protect our people while we were there because we've been going through this so much. This is a, a map of the routes. These are train routes that they're, they're traveling. And they're taking the left side because, or the, the right side because it's shorter. This is what we're trying to tell them is don't go to Mexico. This is where the militarization is, the mercenaries, and they're in border towns now too, which we're documenting. People that actually are in these border towns are saying they're here in these towns. And the long way is they're making it up there to Tijuana and Juarez. So they're making it there, and, but they're getting there. And now I'm seeing something that happened at Standing Rock. There's a little clip of what it, the camps came too big when the veterans showed up. All of a sudden there was a little bit of chaos and the information 
wasn't reaching its area in time. And so I'm seeing that happen in there. And so how do we get communication, MIT thinkers? I want you guys to brainstorm, you know? How do we get communication on the ground? How do we get communication to protect the women and the children there and the transgender that are there and the two-spirit people that are getting attacked there? How do we protect them from being harassed? Or if there's any infiltrators, this is a repeated history though, this is every movement. They're gonna send in infiltrators who I did see there. They're clean cut a certain way, their, their posture was a certain way. It reminded me of the, the militarization that was at Standing Rock when they sent in infiltrators. And you can kind of spot them, you know. When I documented the FBI that was trying to be undercover there, it was really interesting. And he was asking me, so how did you see me? You know, how did you know I was, I was FBI? I said, well, you were no longer a part of the circle. You weren't part of the prayer, you know. You weren't in sync with us. You were here for your own agenda, and it wasn't the collective. So that's how we were able to tell. And I want to make sure they're safe from that, because that's not what they want. But I know what we're going to, do, what we're going to get is propaganda media. I hear their violence. Standing Rock had journalists taking pictures of only trash, and that made it out. And we had to put another video out where Sacred Stone had actually cleaned up one of the, the largest yurt village in the world. They had completely cleaned it out, it was completely clean. And there was a lot of that happening in Osheti, in Rosebud, the cleaning of the camps. But what they did is they piled all the snow in big old piles that created big old, big old uh, mud pits. So everyone was getting stuck. So we had to counteract the media with that. And that's what we got to do here, is to just show people on the ground what's happening and why we need to help them. What is the solution? What is the solution to people that need help? To turn them away? Is that who we are as indigenous people? That's not who I am. So I'm going to just do what I can to show people as, as a, a good relative. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to show my cousins, my family. The technology part. So this is what they had there. And I thought that was kind of crazy when I saw that. They were all piled around 20 people. And so we went and got a board, which was hard to find boards. That was a $40 board, believe it or not. That's like probably four bucks here. And bought a bunch of um, plugins for them to start charging. And then in the middle is going to be a little flyer for hashtags and which uh, media to follow and who's hit that trail before them and just to be in safety and what you need to know about your rights. So we need to educate as much as we possibly can to educate the people that are there. And they're gonna go in different areas of the camp. And people, what I learned too there is they don't wanna to come to the United States. Not everyone wants to come here. Many of them did stay in Mexico and got asylum in Mexico. Some of them only want to come to the United States for two years. They don't want to stay in the United States. They just want to make enough money to go and go home and, and rebuild their lives. Some of them want to go to Canada. So there's this misconception. And, I, and if this administration can take its time to just go and talk and ask them what is it they need and what is it they can do to work with them, then there'll be a different understanding. So this is right after the first caravan left. I went back and I saw them. They were cleaning everything up. Um, after having 7,200 people there, after that, the, the first video I showed where they were all coming in, it looked like a, it was trash all over. And by the time we were done interviewing, it was all clean. They had these crazy little witch brooms, you know, look like straw, and they were like sweeping everywhere up. And it was, it was all clean. I was really, really surprised. So, um, these are the videos that you guys can go through into creating a digital footprint of digital storytelling through indigenous eyes. And the goal is to just empower people to be community journalists and to share your story and to empower your circle around you and be a part of the collective and not as an individual. The individual part is the Dakota Access Pipeline, individual wealth, individual corruption and greed that we witnessed. And, as, and these corporations are coming in like that. But if you can come in as a collective and we can do this together and we can heal together, I just want you guys to know that I'm open for that. But I also want to prepare you that not, of our, not a lot of our Indian people are ready for healing. There's been so much atrocities done that we're all at different la layers of healing and, uh, and able to articulate the anger, able to articulate the hurt, 
and the pain that happened. And we still have those stories that have been from Western culture's ancestors or encroachment. And we're still having them today happening. So with that, just do what you can to educate yourself and empower yourself to learn about who we are as indigenous people, definitely on which land you walk upon. It is your responsibility to educate yourself. Google it. Google the land that you're on. Pick a tribe and then try to find somebody. I don't believe there's any more uh, Massachusetts tribe, but there's Pequots, there's Wapanog Nation, there's, there's tribes where you can go and say, you know, I'm, I need to know. And, and I'm, again, I apologize ahead of time if you don't get received the way I'm explaining to you because we're all at different level of healing. The atrocities that have been done have been not held any accountability as we've seen at Standing Rock. So I'm, I'm hoping that you guys will take that responsibility of holding yourself accountable to honor your forefathers' promises. And I want to say, you know, it's hard to say I forgive you, but that's what we need to do. And it's got to be equally received because we did a lot of things to survive as well. And we did what we could. And the veterans that came, they did that. They did a healing ceremony and they forgave all of Bismarck. They said, we're sorry what we, what we we're sorry for what we did, and we also forgive you for what you did. And so with that, guys, I want to say thank you. The Pijanam, the Pijashin, Numa Shinami, Numa Yadawa, Mogui in spirit with good mind, good words, good spirit. Pijatyu, thank you. All I had was my phone. phone. That's it. I mean, I brought other equipment in case it got dark. It's more of like uh, I bought it on Indigo, which is a crowdsourcing of uh, you, this camera was being built that you can do in low light. And I bought that just in case. But I just did live streaming. I, I now would have left all of my stuff and just I brought two phones just in case one was stolen. Mm -hmm. I also had prepared for it in case I got kidnapped because of the journalists, the, the stores that I heard down there. We had GPS, so people know who I was. I was also GPS in my locations to certain particular people in the States, to an attorney, and um, I just prepared. And uh, the brother that I had that was up there, he was a water protector, and he had his, um, I, I gave him a call, and he, he answered the call and came and walked with me. He walked from Stanley Rock through Mexico, and he had his own challenges, you know? So I had to find somebody that was on the ground that was there and he, when we got into cartel area, that was, the, that was the part where I was like, wow, this is beautiful, beautifully dangerous. You know, don't look at certain people, don't look at the cops, what are you doing, Myron? You know, it's like, I was getting a, really a lesson. Your phone is important, what you have already is mobile media. That is what's important. And I had another lens for this that is about, this is how long it is. And it's a long lens for my camera. You can buy them on Amazon for like $19. For your phone. For your phone. Like a yep, telephoto. Okay. So keep it simple. Well, this is more technology than NASA had when they launched the first man of the moon. <laughs> so we can use it. And you can use it on multiple platforms. And you can get your story out visually. You can articulate it through video, media, social media, blogging. You just have to do it. And if you're just consistent, um, hashtag Eagle and the Condor, um, 
Caravan is what we use. I had these made in two days down there. So I wanted to stimulate the local economy as well. How do you support Mexico? Mexico supported their, the people coming through and they were saying thank you to Mexico all the time there. So um, these were made by hand and I had a whole bunch of them made like 500 and, and shirts as well, but with the hashtag so I can start the communication process. So, so it, was, it was more than that. Community journalism is being a part of the community. That's what it's about. Um, so I went across, I was in transparent as, uh, transparency as possible. So my goal was to go to make sure you're self-reliant, make sure you, know, you have another phone in the communication part, make sure you have plenty of dollars, pesos, because I hit, we, we actually got to one of the last checkpoints and we didn't have no money to cross. And I don't know what, all of a sudden I didn't have no more money on me. Cash. Yeah, pesos. And my credit card, they charged me fifty dollars, three swipes, one hundred fifty at the um, at the Holiday Inn, which seized my credit card. I maxed my credit card to go there, and I just says, "Man, we'll just just follow that diesel. We'll go right through. I'll suffer the consequence later. We got to get to the caravan." And he's all, "Whatever you say, Myron." And we went, and then we started laughing because it was an open road. We, were, we had to back up. We caused traffic all the way back because we had to back up. Come to find out, we could have took the open road. So knowing your route, it's, uh, um, map out your route, what you're going to do. They're only going from, they're going from uh, Guatemala, Honduras, and uh, Salvadorians are coming through. And that's on the map that you've seen up here. Um, digital smoke signals. I make ground contact on where to donate, who's on the ground. I made contact in a journalist group where I actually just have to translate. You're going to be lucky because you read Spanish. And I can share that with you that I was on the live feed on um, what I wanted to do. I met anybody who volunteered that spoke English and I asked them, you know, and they, um, who was there consi consistently. And then I went and talked with the kitchens because at Standing Rock we had like eight, nine kitchens. That many people, they only had one kitchen. The lines went just all, I mean, they were crazy. So, you know, there's solutions. I brought solutions that I wanted to share. So bring solutions. And if you don't, crowdsource those solutions. But be very careful with your location. I, I, I wouldn't say go alone. The women were not alone. They were with groups of men. And that's important. Just for your safety. Not saying that it wasn't a safe place. I didn't feel unsafe only in one place of Mexico. I felt unsafe. But I didn't feel unsafe until he told me I was unsafe. And then I was cautious. But that was my ignorance. Thanks for the questions. Thank you. We're going to have more time for questions in just a, a few minutes. Uh, we have two people, Nicholas Brown, who's an artist and scholar and cultural geography, geographer from Northeastern University. So speak for a few minutes. And then Marissa Mar John, uh, organizer of this one series and also a visiting artist here uh, at Edmond here this evening. So give her a few minutes.
documenting the sort of spectacular forms of state violence that we witnessed at um, Fannie Mae. So one of the, one of the questions for, for us to think about then is uh, uh, the, the limitations of drones or, or to flip around maybe the potential of some of these other forms of practical media that you're talking about, so citizen journalism, uh, to um, address or to document the structure 
gender equity is always also at the forefront of the work. So in the film itself, I mean, Lucretia Dears, a, um, a woman of I started seeing myself getting her harassed by attorneys to show them. And so this, it makes sense to work with allies that were also filming there. It's also a role. How do we work with allies? There was a time when I, I wasn't very comfortable at all because we're scared of being token Indians and taking advantage of, of our identity being used in the media and to counteract indigenous, uh, non-native and indigenous media to always do educating. This is the opportunity to educate and it was the, when I was checking in the media, it was an opportunity to educate and hear their story. And also that many of the people that had their own historical trauma, America has huge historical trauma that they're not dealing with and they're not healing. And, and I, wanna sh I wanted to um, share that I'm starting the healing process. Me and uh, a friend in the back, her name's Heather, who lives in Wapadog Nation. You gonna raise your hand, Heather. She is an original descendant of the Mayflower. And so I think she has more. Um, I really put her on the spot to, you know, I was like, you got to hold your people accountable. You know what I'm saying? So we, we share the solutions and ideas that we're trying to role model with the healing process here. Not everyone I said is ready for it. And I can tell you, it took me most of my life to, to be prepared to sit and, and articulate that. And, and it's not easy, you know, because uh, again, the atrocities that come. So we have to use the media as a visual legal narrative to make sure we can role model these teachings. We can role model how to protect our ceremonies because we're in a digital age. Again, that's where I started coming up with digital protocols that were coming in and uh, what we could use the footage for. Also, when we go in academics, our, our words are being taken and used as ethno historians and where the elders are the getting the credit, they're not getting the credit for it. For me, it's pathologically biased is what I feel, basically just straight up plagiarism, not citing their source. So that's where my master's is, is in digital language preservation, is to make sure that we are citing our sources. So when you guys know you're in Indian country, cite your source, it's really simple. And you're gonna give credit where credit is due because many of the voices and teachings come from indigenous people. And I shared that with the reporters as well. Document, the, you're on treaty land, focus on the 18, uh, 1860, uh, 58 treaties, as focus on the, the, where it's not being held accountable, why we're here, don't um, just say we're protesters, and we're actually telling you no, we're water protectors. Why? Because I knew that the police would take we're protesting and start saying we're inciting a riot, and when we incite a riot, then North Dakota uh, the oil company will start to say, well, after the actions were shutting down the pipeline, now we can claim insurance. No, we're not going to let you off that early, that easy. So we had to articulate it in a way and to go around and share with everybody that there is a process here that is not working for Americans and are taking advantage of it in ways that you guys are letting them. So the visual legal narrative is for you guys. The solution to the problem is you have to hold yourselves accountable to hold your government accountable to honor their promises to us. That's the solution. And I can't stress it enough. We know what the problem is. So when you leave from here, 
you need to hold yourself accountable to understand why we're in this fight and why we're in this environmental change globally, why we're fighting for the water, why we can't drink the water anymore, why we can't swim in this water, why you guys switch to organic food instead of harvesting your own food, how we got disconnected from our food source and where we are economically today, and why we are in constant defense because we're in poverty, trying to protect our homelands, our children, our food, our water. That's why it's hard for us to come out. And it's, I don't want you to feel um, like I'm attacking you. I'm giving you an opportunity to make a wrong right. I'm giving you a solution to say, I can do this. And if you need help, and if you're stirring a little bit and you're getting angry, that's good. Because at least you're feeling something. Because you need to. Because what I witnessed is there's children on people's backs, on their shoulders. They're being kidnapped. And I can no longer stand by and acknowledge that and say this is happening. And when I was down there, some of the people did, oh, don't, don't give them money because there's a next guy. You're going to run out of money. And I was like, where do we get to that point? Because I witnessed that Standing Rock, people from all over the planet were coming and giving with their bodies, with their voices, their words, their legal help. When I got arrested, I had 25 attorneys volunteer. Imagine in our history, in indigenous history, going into a colonial court with a judge that's not native, your representation not native, your jury not native, and you had 25 attorneys protecting you. We didn't have that. And that's why so many of our indigenous people are incarcerated right now, because we didn't have that. Our natural law does not fit into the colonial law. And they're not going to protect it, as we've seen in the Dakota Access Pipeline. As protecting our burial sites, the natural law as well, we're looking at the environmental injustice that happened, that we had protections put in place. I'm asking you guys to hold this government accountable. We're trying to protect the water and the air and the food sources. We need your help to hold yourself accountable. If you're non-native, if you're from another country, then it is still your responsibility to hold yourself accountable than what you migrated here. What country you might migrated doesn't matter. Taiwan, Japan, Tokyo does not matter. Australia, you still have a moral obligation to protect the land that you're on. You're witnessing indigenous people do it. I'm asking you to hold yourself accountable. You can do it. Because you have more than what I witnessed people just all they had what was on their backs. And I seen people do it when they went to Standing Rock, they hitchhiked. One couple did it with eight boxes of donations. You know, churches came and apologized for the doctrine of discovery and the atrocities that happened that this country is built upon. Veterans came and apologized for being on the wrong side of history and apologized for the past atrocities that happened. So I've seen people do it, and I know you can do it. So it just takes one spark in you to say, you know what, I'm going to start with myself and say I apologize for what my tribe has done. I don't know if you guys have been in Nevada, but you know we were one of the last ones that were, were, were hit with colonization. And I can't speak for the tribes that are no longer a part of the part of that voice because they were completely exterminated. So those were our relatives, those were our brothers and sisters. And, and the progress of, of the gold rush, what you guys seen, that is still happening today, what they're calling the different types of gold rushes. And Tesla just moved in. As we move into sustainability, you guys are going to wonder where the, the minerals are going to come. They're coming from Paiute country. So extraction in us moving in a direction, we have to have an agreement. I'm thinking 50 years down the road, this framework needs to be built. This is the seventh generation. We're the answer to our ancestors' prayers. Now together, we're going to have to start building the framework for the next seven generations so they can be the answers to our prayers. And this is something that's been repeated by our elders many, many times. And it's going to take time. You guys in the back that do visual media put together conscious media not just visual media, there needs to be a conscious media in MIT that has awareness and has substance. Community journalism as a collective, not as an individual. So when our sister goes down there to film, she knows she's part of a collective. We just introduced that. We're going to role model. I've never met her before, but she's going to, I know that I'm going to connect her with people down there and do what we can to share the story and amplify it. So I hope that answered your question there. Oh. Very long-term 
systematic, you know, changing, almost like a, a, a flip. And you know, going beyond people and us being um, like held, held accountable, but also just kind of um, like understanding and acknowledging mm -hmm. what has happened. Um, and then, so so there's this kind of long-term shift that's going to be difficult, and you know, <coughs> maybe an event will happen, and it, you know, maybe people will shift right away. And so, like, I kind of I kind of feel like as media majors, um, you know, sometimes it feels like there's a choice. And I'll, Oliver Stone kind of used this term, the security of now, this idea that like because something is happening right now, that's the point. So important, everything um, needs to kind of revolve around it, and then you know, the next day it, it, it no longer feels important, or something like that. And sometimes it feels like you know, streaming live, and, and this can can feed into that, so make something easier to forget and put into the past, and for it not to like um, be part of this kind of systematic change. So could you kind of talk on um, like event filming versus like kind of contributing? Well, who controls the media controls the narrative and the culture. You know, so Hollywood has done a really great example of romanticizing the Indian. And so I had to make sure I worked with Hollywood there. And we had disagreements. They, they, one of my editors, you know, was one of their editors. We, we, can, we uh, indigenized her and opened freed her mind. <laughs> And um, we got into it when I first met her. I was like, you know, I, I'm not going to use Last of the Mohican music in this. You know, and, and, and the guy that was there, he was really nice. He was really nice, and, you know, he was just real gentle. And I was like, wow, maybe I can work with this guy. I left, and I came back, and I heard how he talked to his crew. But he was not a nice guy. He's not very polite. He's not respectful. He didn't take care of them. In a place where we were taking care of each other, I was witnessing that not happening to the allies that were coming in. Then when I came back in, he was back to his place. And I says, uh, I'm not going to do it. I held my ground. I'm not going to let you romanticize us again and change the message. When you have original singers here, people and elders that can articulate us academically, professionally, legally, culturally, spiritually, united as a collective. And so he, uh, we, we argued and argued. And finally, he came down to taking everything out and just the native guy that was playing flute. You know, and I said, we got flute players here. Why don't you use anybody that's here? I'm a flute player. This guy's a flute player. We got drummers, singers. Cultural appropriation in the media was happening, and we had to stop it. You know, and that's by educating. So I was willing to have the patience to educate. I'm a historical trauma trainer. I train the trainers. The goal is to really um, help, as well as myself. I'm still learning. You know, we have that patriarchy way of thinking, and to get away from that, we're a matriarchy tribe, so we still have that way of thinking every now and then. So I want to make sure that, you know, that you understand that that's, that's in the Western culture, and it's in our daily lives sometimes, and we don't even know it. And I struggle with it at times, because I'm trying to survive as well. That's the colonized thinking. I'm trying to decolonize, and also, uh, Numa Shinami re-traditionalized my mind so I can go on that process and start healing my spirit. And it's hard because sometimes I got to out white man the white man and then go re-traditionalize, you know? And it's not easy. And uh, coming back to it, I got to remember, you know, and be humble and then open that, open that door for somebody else and pull them through. Because in Western culture, you're not taught that. You're not taught that. You're an individual. You know, you're shooting for the American dream, which you got to be dreaming to experience. So I hope that answers your question is, you know, educating in the media and to make sure that, you know, for me as an indigenous filmmaker or storyteller, digital storyteller, I was born in the second decade of the 21st century. Right now is where I'm at. I wasn't born in the 1800s, although I can you know, recall the stories that were told by my tribe or my elders or my grandma, my uncles, my family, or stories of our community. I can still share that with you. We still have those. So I'm going to continue to, to share with you. We have our creation stories predating Western contact, stories of dinosaurs, stories when the water was high. I'm going to share that with you. We're still practicing our ceremony. I was born in a baby basket made out of willows off of the land that we can no longer harvest because of the contamination of the willows. 
You know, we used to have fish in our lake that we could no longer eat. We're called agaitakara. But I'm going to show it to you in film. I want to show it to you in media. I'm going to educate you. And if you can open your heart and mind that I'm still here and I'm not in the past, I'm still here today, then, then we're going to change that paradigm shift. And I'm hoping we can do that by digital storytelling. Is it the answer? No, it's not the answer. But it is part of the solution to the problem. language, the loss of dignity, the systematic racism in the education, the things that we see in cultural appropriation, which you guys are going to see your kids that are going to start coming back dressed like Indians or pilgrims or the artwork. That's another example about it. It is not okay. Educate yourself about that. That's not okay because you're carrying on false narrative there. The food deserts are, in our most reservations, they're, they're like in... Um, there's, there's a lack of traditional foods in there. And at the turn of the century, the government was given tribes food rations that were killing us, creating diabetes, gallstones, cholesterol, blood sugar, all these issues that we're seeing in this generation right now. And now we're kind of flipping it back. Some tribes have more access to their foods than others, but it's still so expensive that it is easier to go to Walmart and it's easier to go to the smoke shop and get these foods that are not healthy. And that's mostly in low-income communities. It's cheaper to go get this toxic food than it is to get healthier food. And that's the food desert on the reservations. But we're trying to create um, community uh, gardens, and trying, to, trying to create most of Indian countries moving into that direction. They're trying to get us to eat tilapia, which is not our food. You know, we're trout eaters. So <laughs> I just, I'm like, Let's, we got to create a solution here. So. My, my hippie buddies, I'm like, you guys got to create a solution with us. If you want to work with us, you can't make us think the way you're thinking. We don't think that way. So, you know, we can't go hug a tree, but we know it's got energy. You know, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna pray in the way we were taught, that is taught to us since time and memorial way before Western contact, those original instructions of the creator. So that's the food desert part is our medicine is to get back away from those and then try to have a, a, a community garden that we do, hoop houses, and, um, but it's getting harder and harder because the land is contaminated and there's no way for them to roam and move like they used to. We can no longer hunt deer. Uh, the rabbits are contaminated as well. At a certain time of season, you can eat them. So there's, so there's some challenges. I hate to be the Debbie Downer on that, but we're trying. And um, as we keep moving forward, we're just gonna have to continue to just find solutions. So for, um, like myself, after Standing Rock, I didn't realize I had heavy PTSD. And many water protectors did. But you know, also we're, we have PTSD already throughout Indian country from what we experienced from boarding schools. And um, we got almost, almost used to it, but this was a different level. Protecting each other though, like the communication like this and, and social media, and when she gets down there and does her, her media and she can share where she's at and we can actually send people over to help her or making sure you're in alignment with people. Healers are also going down to work with the people down there. People have been reaching out, we're sending healers down there to share the energy and to help them as well. Bilingual healers, which is really awesome. So there's a lot of allies jumping on board with solutions that are decolonizing. Again, you have to recognize you're colonized what are the colonized ways you're bringing or are you, what are you, are you bringing a, a solution as a collective or are you part of a team 
or are you going down as an individual? So those are the things I would say, if you're gonna work with indigenous people, think of those really small things that are huge because it, it does impact how we think and how we take care of each other. That help you? So there's different ways of healing. Um, I found different ways to heal and I, I went and um, family was medicine and being back at home in the land. Um, some things re-triggered like the plane that flew 24 seven the helicopter, I, all of a sudden I'm thinking of Standing Rock. Um, I think uh, sometimes when I watch a certain thing on TV and I see propaganda media, that's why I went down there. I wanted to counteract it and show grassroots community journalism, those things. And I don't see a healing component in media unless you do. You know, I don't see it in there. I don't see that um, those natural laws to help us feel good. And that's what we need to see. And I think that's what community journalism is doing is the healing process. We have that word. We call it a nanishtahai, which is like your breath of life. And, and it's like your, your, whatever you say is so important. It's got medicine and it carries. And I say, wow, that is a beautiful scarf you're wearing. See, the smile comes right on. That's the medicine that we have to each other. I would say I can only use my own experience. You know, um, in the beginning, I would grab water protectors and say, this person was on the front line. As uh, for us, it's ego, right? You're, you're talking about ego. And when you go home, when I go home anyways, my ego is checked because no one cares what I did. <laughs> and I love it because, you know, I can, I can be who I am back home. And that's what it's about is checking our ego Making sure, you know, one of the biggest things is, why did you come here at Standing Rock? You know, I came there to film and use media to help protect our people, protect the water. I went to Mexico to help see, to help amplify a message that I was seeing wasn't being amplified. It wasn't about me. When it's about me, then it's ego. This message is about water protectors. This message is about educating as much as we can. And if we can counteract that ego, then I hope we can do it in a good way. The other thing is, is how we're attacked. You know, social media, you can get attacked. Death threats. Um, I've had several death threats. People attack me and follow through with the attacks. And our own people, the jealousy that comes up in the movement, it's your own people. They're a part of that. And I acknowledge that I've got work to do. So I'm like always like trying to see how can I improve what I'm doing? Am I saying the right thing? 
Am I amplifying someone's message? Because it's not about me, it's about what we're protecting. But ego is the most important one you gotta check. And if you can't, and I've seen people, you know, say, hey brother, you know, you gotta, you know, we have this talk. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh, they get mad. I'm saying, hey, it's not about you. You know, it's about what you're protecting. You made it about you. I'm just sharing with you. And that's been done to me with elders. You know, I have a group of elders to help me, keep me in check. And I'll call them and say, you know, I wanna make sure I'm saying the right things. Are you watching? Yes. Okay. Am I, am I sharing the water protector story? Yes, okay. We had 838 water protectors. It was not about me after that whole movement. It was about the safety and the freedom of water protectors that came and also our allies that stood with us. That's what it was about after this. I kept staying, I was there for eight months afterwards. The documentary is so they couldn't, they didn't have to keep calling me, you know, for footage and media because I put most of it in there to make sure that also people wasn't, um, incriminated so yeah social media does do that and it does sensationalize but if you can check your ego and if you have a good circle that can check you and I'm fortunate I met people from Black Lives Matter Occupy Wall Street that told me here's what's gonna happen after this is Standing Rock is everyone went home here's what's gonna happen because this is what happened with them in the American Indian movement it's us where we attack each other where did the money go? Could you share some things that were shared to me? Where did the money go, Myron? How did you get rich off a of wake? You know? Well, many people don't know. After I leave MIT, I'm going to train, which we created a youth media fund to train frontline media. That's where it went. We have to role model the change because I've seen it in our communities all the time when a new leader comes into position. Oh, look at this guy, he's driving a new car. Instead of thinking, I'm glad his car can make it to the state capitol and represent us. Or I'm glad he can you know, get there as long as he's doing his job. So we have a lot of healing to do. And I'm learning how to also, there's some of the places where I come, I come in and I don't have that, um, the tools. So I have to humble up myself as well and go get those tools. I'm a father. So I look at like, I'm abandoning my family as well by doing this. So I have to make sure that I stay balanced. And, and that I don't take away. There's a lot of sacrifice in what we do and, it's, and, and I'm praying that I do it in a good way and I'm sharing the stories of people that don't have the voice and I'm hoping that I use that platform that I can share as much as I possibly can in a good way and if I get ego, you come and check me, <laughs> please. I really, I mean, I'm serious. You can share with me, Myron. I wish you would share a little bit more about this. And I admit that I don't have some of the information and knowledge to do it, but I will try. I will do what I can to share that platform.